I would like to introduce Douglas Adams to you. A man who needs no introduction, and I'm going to spend the next couple of minutes introducing him to you. Douglas wrote a radio series called The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which some of you might have heard of. Uh, this was followed by books, towels, computer games. It may be followed by a film one day. <laughs> Walker's laughter. <laughs> Eventually a possible film. You, you will, there will be a question and answer session. You can ask Douglas about the film. If you want to see a grown man in time. <laughs> he wrote the only trilogy with a uh, fourth book. So long and thanks for all the fish. And then finally fled the merry world of hitchhiking towels and people with two heads to write Dirk Gentler's Solicit Detective Agency. In terms of plotting, it does owe a little to some episodes of Doctor Who, which is something that Douglas will no doubt tell you about. In <laughs> some unseen episodes of Doug, Doctor Who, I should add. Never waste anything. Never waste anything. Never throw anything away. Uh, so it's my privilege and pleasure to present to you a man with a large number of word processes. <laughs> well, this is going to be an audience-driven talk. Um, I, I don't say anything at all until somebody asks me a question. Well, right, well, that's it. Well, we'll go on to the signing. <laughs> What's up with the projected uh, Hitchhiker's film? Ah! <laughs> well, I spent... Um, I spent most of 1983 um, living rather miserably in Los Angeles, working on it, and uh, did three different drafts, uh, each of which, which was worse than the previous one, oddly enough. Um, there was a, there was a, I think there were some sort of fundamental misconceptions at the base of, at the, at the bottom of this film project. Let me give you an example. After I had um, written the first draft of the screenplay, I had a big meeting with the producer. He looked really sort of worried when I came in and said, look, I have a problem with this. And I said, yeah, what is it? And he said, well... He said, you do this big thing in the screenplay, you do this big sort of build-up, and we're going to find the answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything. And you build it up, and you build it up, and the audience is going to really want to know what it's going to be. And then what do you do? You just say it's 42. Well, I think the audience is going to feel really jerked off. <laughs> this is the point at which I began to wonder whether we were sort of on the same wavelength. Um, I mean, I felt he was a man who was actually just bought three gallons of chocolate chip ice cream and is complaining about all the little black lumps in it. Um, and anyway, after several months of futility, I'm afraid, um, I eventually decided to sod this and came back home to England. Um, anyway, so it's gone on through various different versions since then. Um, have you got any advice for successive writers? Yes, don't blow up the world in chapter one. <laughs> Because <laughs> you'll need it later. Is that what we going wrong all this time? Yeah, that's uh, yeah. I really, I really would not do that. I would rewrite the first chapter so the earth is not blown up. <laughs> yep. When uh, I'm reading about the time that Soul and Faithful and the Fish came out, you spend some time on an entirely new project, unlike anything you've ever seen before. Oh, well, that was later than So Long and Thanks for All the Fish. Um, no, the, the, um, this, we're talking about the, the Interactive Compact Disc, CDI. Um, yeah, I'm ready to go. There's a great friend of mine who works for um, um, a company in Los Angeles who are at the forehead of this technology. I mean, their company is geared to doing CDI. And every six months I speak to him, and he says the technology will be ready in six months. <laughs> so, you know, uh, who knows? What was the hope of bureaucracy? Well, when I moved into the, the flat I live in at the moment, I got, a, um, I got a mortgage from the bank to do it with. Uh, but when I was sending out change of address cards, I thought, well, I'll, I reckon well, the bank, you know, this flat is security on the loan, um, that they've given me to buy the flat with. Therefore, I would suspect they probably know where it is. Um, but I sent them a change of address card anyway. And then um, the first bank statement I got after that uh, was sent to my old address. So I sent them another change of address card. And the next statement I got after that was also sent to my old address. So I wrote them a little letter saying, look, for heaven's sake, you of all people, having financed the move to this flat, must know where it is and that I've moved. And uh, they, they, they wrote, um, 
very apologetic letter saying, yes, we do realise, um, uh, sorry, we've been very silly and this won't happen again. You, you, you won't be troubled anymore. We brought our records up to date and so on. Guess where they sent the letter? <laughs> um, so this actually forms the basis of the bureaucracy game, which involves in all kinds of increasingly catastrophic adventures. Your actual object in the game is quite simply to get your bank to acknowledge a change of address card, and everything else flows from that. Well, oddly enough, there, have, there has been a sort of vague thought for a long time about doing Life, the Universe, and everything on radio. But also, there's been a vague thought about doing it on television. Now, that's dependent on the owners of the film rights giving me a dispensation to do it. You know, we've been asking them for a couple of years, and still, their answer is not clear yet. Uh, it, if we did it on television, I mean, it would actually um, be a dramatization of that book rather than sort of bear any necessary relation to the first series. But the idea would be to do it with, um, well, I, I, won't, I mean, I won't go into all the details, but um, uh, it's, it's something that might happen at some point. It's not imminent. Anybody else? Yeah? If you did it on radio, would you use Jeff Perkins again as producer? Um, I would love to. Uh, it's, it's just a question of whether, he, uh, you know, he's a busy man these days and mostly in television. Uh, it would be a question of whether we could actually sort of match schedules to do it. I mean, I'd, I would very, very much hope he would do it. Can you tell us about Kevin uh, and how you ripped off your scraps off of his script? <laughs> <laughs> well, only a little bit, actually. Um, <laughs> I used... I used the bit of the character, you know, the character of, um, of Cronotus as written in, in that. Because it was the only bit of that script I actually liked. And people kept on saying, well, will you publish that script? Will you publish that script? And I didn't want to because I didn't like it. I didn't think it was very good. But I did actually like that character. So I just sort of rescued him, really. From him, I mean, there was only about, I mean, apart from the name, there was probably a couple of dozen lines of dialogue. So it was, you know, it wasn't a major ripoff. It was just... Well, might as well rip off. I wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any plans to dramatise Don't Go Crazy? It's being talked about at the moment. We don't know which route to go, whether to do a movie or to do television or to do what, I don't know. Um, I mean, I think I can say that if we do it, um, I'm not sure how heavily I'll be involved because you know, I've got more books to write and more things to do. And I don't want to get in the same trap that I did in Hitchhiker of, of constantly having to sort of rewrite everything I did for one medium after another, after another, after another. I'd much rather just carry on doing new stuff and get people that you know I know, like, or trust to, to do it. I mean, if you get somebody you know, like, and trust to do it, you will probably have a better result than getting somebody you don't know, don't like, and don't trust, and being involved yourself. I mean, I'd rather, I want to get on and do new things. So ho hopefully it'll happen, but if it doesn't happen, we shall see. Yeah? Any more safaris, Brian? <laughs> uh, yes, most of next year. When are you on? Uh, probably about March, I think. Going to various remote parts of the world to look for rare, endangered, and exotic animals and make jokes about them. Um, no, I mean, that's, that's not quite true. Um, no, I don't know if anybody happened to see this, but a couple of years ago I went to Madagascar for the Observer Colour Magazine and the World Wildlife Fund to look for an animal called the Ai Ai. And um, I had the most amazing time there. It was really sort of quite a revelation to me. So um, as a result of that, myself and the guy who fixed it up um, this is one just called Mark Carwardine. He and I are going off uh, to Australia to look for an animal called the thylacine, otherwise known as a Tasmanian tiger. As far as I can see, for the reason that, that, that it does not live in, in Tasmania and is not a tiger. Um, going to New Zealand to look for a creature called a kakapo, which is a flightless parrot. Like a number of birds on, uh, on New Zealand, um, because up to 100 years ago, um, when Western settlers first arrived at New Zealand. Up to that point, there had never been any predators there. Uh, a lot of the birds had sort of given up flying. They thought, well, bugger this for a lot. Why bother? You know? <laughs> and uh, we'll, we'll go for a waddle instead. And the kakapo is uh, as a flightless parrot, which has lost the ability to fly, obviously, but has retained the ability to run up trees and jump out of them. Uh, <laughs> uh, along with, um, sort of uh, with a sort of rudimentary parachuting ability it has. And we're going to look for the Komodo dragon lizard in Komodo. Um, that'll be not hard to find. All you need to do is to go to Komodo and take a three-day-old dead goat with you. <laughs> um, uh, to which they're peculiarly partial. So 
So anyway, we're doing a series of these, and we'll be doing uh, doing a series of radio programs and a book, which we call Last Chance to See. But um, as you know, I'm a strong believer that uh, on radio you get better scenery than television. So, uh, London to New York, the city route. Are you ever going to be doing that? Um, I hope so, one day. I have just no idea when it's going to fit in. Uh, this was because, um, well, I seem to have spent a lot of time sort of commuting across the Atlantic. By, um, um, and I just got fed up with sitting in planes. It's really like living in a vacuum cleaner, isn't it? Um, I mean, you sort of get stuck in this noisy tube. So on one occasion, I went across by QE2, because I was offered the chance of, if I sit here and do this, on the QE2 for a couple of hours, it gave me a free passage, so I thought, well, why not? I discovered why not when I got on it. Um, <laughs> it really is a sort of floating holiday in. So I thought, um, I wonder how possible it is to go from London to New York by train. Uh, basically, this, will, as you will work out, involves making a left. Uh, <coughs> there, are, there are certain problems involved with it, like getting across Siberia. Um, now, the channel, obviously, is a problem. But, I mean, I think one just has to do the hovercraft there. Um, the, the Bering Straits are the other problem, but you can walk across the Bering Straits at the right time of the year. But uh, it looks like there, there, there might be a way of doing it. But uh, um, I don't know quite when. when. I mean, it'll, it'll be a couple of years, I think. But I'm determined to do it one day. And so I'm doing a book on it called London to New York, the City Route. Any more questions, or should we um, get on with uh, signing some books? Can we draw this question and answer session to a close? Thank Neil, who's uh, Douglas's biographer. <laughs> Douglas, for uh, spending his Neil's biography. <laughs>